And I would say to you, Senator, that you run a busy, clean, safe prison where everybody um, has a sense of, of, of safety. Um, I think that's safe for staff, safe for inmates, and I think you're gonna get a better outcome um, from the programs that we're providing. So I agree with you 100%. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Leno. Um, I do want to ask, how do you, I, I really believe that we need to get this uh, very deep uh, and, and excellent preparation and ongoing support for correctional, for correctional officers. At the same time, what do you do about actually having a zero tolerance approach for inmate abuse? And because those are two sort of different sides of the same coin, and it, it actually is coming home to me because I've received many, many questions recently about in our school system, the problem of sexual harassment and how does a, how does trying to support culture change interact with saying, but these things aren't, we don't allow, and you will be gone if you do them. <laughs> um, have you begun to sort out how those two things happen? Well, I, I told you that it's a multifaceted yeah. approach. I, um, I firmly believe that having an internal affairs investigation that identifies the facts, um, is fair with the, the employees and identifies um, those lines that you're mentioning are, are very important. And I think we have that today. Um, we have an internal affairs process. It's the um, most monitored um, system in the nation, I believe. Um, the OIG monitors 30% of our cases. Um, I, I think we have this elaborate process that involves lawyers um, where that line is clearly drawn. Um, I don't think anybody would disagree with you that if a staff member is um, abusing an inmate, then they need to be disciplined. Um, and in fact, that's what's happening today. Um, so I th if, if that answers your question, it, it's too easy, I think, for me to say, I'm gonna have a zero tolerance um, and have it be meaningful, Senator. I, I think that everybody out there understands that if an employee um, involves themselves in that kind of behavior, that there's a process by which th that they could lose their job. Um, and I think I told you at the last hearing, it's not uh, if it's gonna go wrong. For me, it's gonna, it's when it's gonna go wrong. And I hope that we're a department that's judged by how we proactively address these situations. Um, and, and I feel like we, the department has, um, you know, high, high Desert, for example, using that as a, an example, have been very proactive in trying to address that, all of the issues, stress management to the employees, uh, some uh, training for the staff, um, some internal affairs investigations that are monitored by the OIG. Um, so I think it's been that holistic approach to it um, that, that's gonna address the thing. But uh, let me just say this too. The staff at, the, at High Desert State Prison can't be painted with the, the broad brush that's sometimes painted, the generalizations that are used, and they can't feel that they're not supported. Um, and so I think it's, it's on me um, directly to let those staff know that they are supported and that we are going to take corrective action when it's warranted, um, but that we support them and, and are gonna help them be better and be involved in the rehabilitation process that we discussed. Okay, I think that that, um, that is gonna be important. And maybe as we also go th take some more looks at this, that we look at what happened that internal affairs didn't identify some of those systemic problems early enough for us, that it was an OIG report and maybe we need to change some of the ways we're, we're dealing with our internal affairs. But that could be part of this larger culture change too, in terms of how many, uh, how many various problems emerge. <laughs> if we could keep them from emerging, everybody's life would be better. 
I, can I say one thing to that yeah. point, and, and this is maybe an admission of my own failure. When I came back as the undersecretary, I had um, the prison law office come to me. I had some staff um, from the legislature come to me and identify that there was a problem in High Desert. Um, I did what I thought was a reasonable thing. I went and looked at the statistics to see if High Desert was out of line to any of the other prisons. They were not. I went and talked to the, um, the ombudsman's office, who is regularly in the prison, and asked them. It was not. I sent a team of staff up there to the prison um, and got a report back that it was not at the, um, certainly as the level that was ultimately reported. I went back and looked at the OIG reports for the last four years, three years, um, and the OIG reports did not address those things. So what I would represent to you is that it is hard to find those things. Um, we have systems in place, and I'm certainly open to listen to other things, but it is extremely difficult, I think, um, to find it. And when we find it, we need to have a proactive approach that includes a, dis a fair and uh, consistent disciplinary process. Yeah, good, thank you. You know, thank you very much, because I think we're all really concerned about how we stop abuses of human beings in our systems and um, how that makes a safer and better situation for, for everyone. Plus, it defines who we are as a people. We don't want to run places that um, allow cruelty to other people or um, in treatment of them that is going to be debilitating uh, to them. So um, again, uh, you know, thank you very much for the overview. I understand you're going to be with us on the second panel too because you're taking Ken Pogue's place. Um, and I'm going to ask uh, Stacy Lopez and Bob Barton, Robert Barton, the um, Inspector General, and Stacy Lopez, who's the Associate Director of the Selection and Employment Development Department, who does the recruitment and training. <laughs> so welcome uh, both of you to this panel. And um, what we're interested in is your take on now, uh, what are the current and emerging practices that impact the effective correctional officer workforce? Stacy, start. About, um, all the things that have been changing with the Correctional Officer Academy. Uh, we started recruiting again in 2000, May of 2013. As you know, we had um, a recruitment effort of trying to fill about 7,000 vacancies statewide. So it was um, a really big endeavor to start recruiting extremely fast. We did a number of um, recruitment within the state, within out of the state, to recruit for those 7,000 positions. I'm happy to report today that we are slowing the academy down a bit because we have graduated already over 5,500 cadets since um, August of 2013. So we have um, filled our vacancies to date, but we still have to keep up with the attrition, which is about 142 that we lose to promotion or retirement every month. So we obviously are still keeping the academy going, but just um, not at the pace and the numbers that we have been for the last almost three years. In the last three, almost three years, we went from a 16-week academy we started and then transitioned over to a 12-week academy in July 27th of 2015. So during this time, we were looking at the curricula to see like how, how could we change some things with the curricula because when I arrived there in May of 2013, we had, a, we had to ramp up very fast and so we had to roll things out very quickly. So we used a lot of the curricula that was already established, that was already been, had been used for several years prior, but knew that we needed to look at it and see how we could further enhance the curricula and add some things such as, as Secretary Kernan mentioned, the communication and de-escalation techniques We've always had communication threaded through our lessons in the 16 week, but we wanted to further enhance that. 
and really focus more on communication throughout the entire academy. So they're not hearing it in just a 16 hour block. So the communication and de-escalation curricula was developed and as Secretary Kernan mentioned for a 28 modules, which is threaded through the entire academy, which is now the 12 week academy. So the total 12 week academy is 480 hours. And so for, we thought it was really important to have at least 28 hours of this new curricula. And not only that, we, we didn't do a great job at putting rehab and threading rehab through the academy prior to the academy, um, when the academy was open before. So one of the things we did, we brought in our acting director, Brant Chotley, who's over Dep Division of Rehabilitative Programs as our subject matter expert and developed um, a curricula uh, on, on rehabilitative programs. And so not previously we would have someone come in the first week Cadets are glossy-eyed, they're not really listening. So that was not the opportune time to have them come in and talk about rehabilitative programs. So now we have two uh, two-hour classes and one is given during the fourth week of the academy, I'm sorry, the seventh week of the academy and the other is the last week of the academy. So the two hours that's given during the last week talks about what is the correctional officer's role when they get to the institution with regards to rehabilitative programs. Now you're probably thinking four hours, wow, out of 480 hours, we could do more. Absolutely. So those are things that we're looking at now and seeing how we can thread more about re rehabilitative programs throughout the academy. But it can't just stop in the academy. We have to also look when they leave us because we can train them up for 12 weeks and, and you know, teach them all about communication and de-escalation and rehabilitative programs and leadership and all of that, but we have to continue it when they get to the prisons. So, so we took that out further to the institutions, which is, as Secretary Kernan mentioned, they have block training annually. And so part of that also, they'll get a curricula on communication and de-escalation. And we're looking at also adding in that rehabilitative piece, because again, we. We, again, we can train them at, for 12 weeks, but once they leave us, they leave us. So we wanna make sure that that's carried out into the field. So also that not only the COs are getting this training, but our sergeants, our lieutenants, our captains, our AWs, they're all also receiving the training during this annual, during their annual um, block training. So some of the things um, that, uh, some of the other things that we've been looking at is, uh, and we have in the academy, are the leadership and the ethical decision making. We know how important that is when a correctional officer hits the line and really has to make those tough decisions. So that's all, all those things are threaded in our current 12 week, but we know we can add some more to further enhance that. But again, I, take, I say again, we have to bring it out to the field too, so they understand also that it's important that they have all of these, um, all of these tools available to them and making sure that we um, educate them on these things and what the direction that we're heading and have been head heading. So I guess what I, I would, it's been, a, it's been a challenge to not only get to 7,000 correctional officers but also developing and changing curricula, but it's been a positive change and I'm very excited that you all are interested in what we're doing because I think that training is always, I mean the first thing that that happens if an incident happens is they come to our office or they go to the institution service training and say, was that person trained and were they trained on this? And so it's very critical that we provide the adequate training to not only this correctional officers, but to all of our staff um, department wide. Um, so some one thing also I wanted to mention is that this will continue, that we're looking again at ways to further enhance the correctional officer training you know, we've had a lot of good um, ideas brought to us from outside entities as well to have us look at different things. So we're not afraid to, to look at things and look at best practices. And that's been um, a lot of our mission for the last almost three years since we've been reopened. So we're always looking to enhance it because training is always evolving and always has to change. So um, I think that would be probably the, what we've been doing for the last almost three years. So. I would be happy to take any questions. Okay, and I, well, I think let's hear from the Inspector General, and I don't know if you'd want to add anything, Secretary Kernan, then we can have questions for everybody. Okay. Well, thank you, Senators, again, for inviting me. 
to speak on what I think is a very, very important topic. It's a $10.5 billion topic for the state of California. And if we accept the status quo that used to exist, that public safety is best served by locking people up, warehousing them as long as possible, then spitting them back out to reoffend, then we don't need this hearing. But I don't think any of us accept that, and I don't think the people of California accept that. And I know certainly as a nation, we're moving away from that type of mindset. It's clear though, if we do that, then we're raising expectations for CDCR, not only to keep our prisons safe and secure, but enhancing public safety by creating an employee base that supports the rehabilitative mission. We need to do things to make that possible. And we've heard a few of the things that are changing in that direction. There are many things we could do that we, when we look at outside systems, but I would be the first to say that California is unique. We're unique in sheer size. We're unique in the, as mentioned by the secretary, amazing amount of turnover created by the huge surge in hiring in the 80s, where those people are terming out for lack of a better term. Um, maybe not a term that uh, legislators <laughs> certainly are foreign to, but that's what's happening. And we also have a lot of employees who do a very difficult job very well every day. But it only takes that small percentage to cause the disparagement for the entire department and sometimes to cause irreparable harm. I would agree with Secretary Kernan that certainly at High Desert, the overwhelming majority of employees there are doing a hard job very well. But when you have some, and we saw this with Rampart, we've seen this with other law enforcement divisions where it only takes a small number of people who aren't following the rules to cause that problems. Problems that then permeate, not because others necessarily duplicate it, but because they may look the other way. So I wanna talk about four things when we're talking about what it takes to change the culture. One would be higher formal education requirements for entry level COs. The second would be peer intervention training. The third, resiliency, mindfulness training, and fourth, the increased use of cameras. And I'd like to talk about each of those briefly. Education and the need for a recognition for college educated law enforcement is not new. It's been talked about since the 1960s. In 1967, the President's Commission on Law Enforcement recommended an increasing of the minimum education requirement for law enforcement. In 1993, there were 7% of the law enforcement major agencies that had a requirement of a two-year degree. In 2003, that was up to 27%. Currently, we require a GED or a high school education for a correctional officer incoming. In 1973, the American Bar Association agreed and declared that in order to commit to sustaining public safety habits of self-discipline, understanding human behavior, the ability to communicate, knowing how to communicate with different people under different conditions um, are all of the things that one learns in a liberal education program and is believed to be necessary to increase the professionalism of law enforcement. In 1987, the president of the American Correctional Association stated, the three most important factors for professionalizing correctional officers is education, education, education. In 1989, the then Chief of Selection and Training for the California Department of Corrections, Carlos Sanchez, was quoted as saying, we should increase our focus on attracting college-trained applicants. And I am aware of, and the Secretary indicated, we recruit on college campuses. In 1992, this very legislature commissioned a National Correctional Officer Education Survey, survey excuse me, to address the issue of California's correctional officers hiring practices and indicated a need or necessity for greater education. The research about correctional officers and law enforcement in general is just now beginning to flourish in this area. However, the research that has been done regarding the effects of formal education and the data spanning the last few decades indicate that officers with college education are subjected to fewer disciplinary measures. They perform better in the academy. They receive higher supervisor evaluations. They have fewer disciplinary problems. They are assaulted less often. 
Uh, they use force less often, they miss fewer days of work, they cope better with stress, they adapt better to organizational change, they communicate better, and at the very minimum, write better reports. All of these skills, I think, would help within our system here in California. I understand that currently we have about 35,000 applications on hold. I have to believe that there's a significant portion of those that have at least a two-year AA degree. And I understand the department offers incentives to persons who are pursuing higher education. The problem I've heard from talking to officers and managers is that that doesn't mean much to give you a couple hundred dollars extra when the department doesn't support you when you are in college classes. And a lot of this is out of necessity. Oftentimes it's the younger officers with the least amount of seniority that have to, or that want to take those classes and yet when they are told that they're ordered over or because they're low on seniority have to work extra shifts or transfer or whatever the case may be, it's very detrimental to them being able to pursue a college education. I vetted over 50 current and past wardens. A large percentage of them indicated to me that they would have liked to have pursued higher education, but the manner of work and the way the system works within CDCR doesn't always allow that to happen. I don't know what the exact answer is. I realize it would require management and labor working together to try to figure out a way where if an officer brought his schedule in from his college classes and said, I have this schedule, and that's something that we're gonna work around when it comes to order overs or transfers or things of that nature, um, I think that would go a lot further in getting officers through that educational upward mobility track than giving them a few hundred dollars. In addition, when we, when we talk to officers, or I've talked to officers out in the field who have that education, they would say, and I would agree, you don't need a college education to learn the job. You're gonna learn most of it on the job. For any of us that are lawyers, the same is true. I didn't learn how to practice law in law school. You learn to think like a lawyer. When you're in college, you're learning other skills, critical analysis, critical thinking, communication skills, other intangibles, you're maturing in dealing with people of diverse cultures, of certainly those of opposite opinions than yourself. Unlike when you enter without that, and what you're told is, this is the way we do things here, and you just follow that paramilitary approach. So that brings me to my second um, suggestion, and that is peer intervention training. I understand that the challenges of federal court mandated overlays and block training leave very little room for people like Ms. Lopez to really impact the ongoing block training. Um, however, there are other ways to do it that are informal. Uh, Michael Quinn, who was a longtime uh, Minneapolis department veteran who ran both internal affairs and one of the most um, dangerous, if you would, assignments dealing with those career criminals that were targeted by that uh, area as being repeat offenders, typically gang members. He turned that unit around from a unit that had the most citizen complaints to the unit that had no citizen complaints. And he did that by the use of peer intervention training. And it has to come at the first level supervisor at that sergeant level. I've been through academies myself. I've been through officer candidate school. Oftentimes in the military and in law enforcement, when you get off the bus from the academy, somebody says, forget everything they taught you, I'm gonna tell you how to survive. And not across the board, but if those same people, when they met you said, I want you to remember everything you learned in the academy, and not only will we put our life on the line for you when it comes to a dangerous situation, we're gonna protect your family and your financial future and ours by not letting you do stupid things. Because when we see signs of you going off the rails, when we see you start to lose your temper, or when we see you pull out your baton when it's not warranted, or when we see or hear from you comments that we realize, okay, something else is going on, we're gonna talk about it. And we're gonna figure out a way to do that that doesn't humiliate you, that doesn't make you look soft. Because I will tell you, within the culture of CDCR, that is the worst thing you can have as an officer. It's also the worst thing you can have as an inmate, is to appear soft. 
So we have to change that mindset. And peer intervention doesn't have to be necessarily a formalized block training class. If you can teach those supervisors, those lieutenants, the techniques, so that when someone shows up, it's as much as I teach my new supervisors, they're to have an expectations discussion with every new employee. And if those expectations are, we're not going to allow you to do something that's out of policy. We're going to, in fact, not cover for you. In fact, we're going to report you for your own good when you do stupid little stuff so that you don't do stupid big stuff and so that none of us have to be either possibly uh, at risk because of your actions. When I was a police officer and would talk with fellow officers when something would come up, and I believe this has to be happening in the CO ranks as well. When you see the article about the, the CO up north who stole money from an, a guy's wallet when he was out on a narcotics bus with the local task force, that makes you sick as a peace officer. Because for me, not only was that person acting no better than criminal, they were tarnishing the image of my entire profession. And there was nothing worse to me than a bad cop. And I have to believe that's true of correctional officers, that they have that same outrage. And so if that's the case, we need them to realize that taking care of one another sometimes means calling one another out. By the same token, if we're going to do that, we have to change the culture in what it means to be smart about your job. And that's my third point, the resiliency, the mindfulness training. There are a great variety of mindfulness trainings and we have groups offering currently to bring those into the prisons and in fact one is going to be introduced at High Desert. In addition to which, statewide and nationwide, there are examples of these programs going in. Unless you think that it's something that again is touchy-feely, I was first introduced to mindfulness as a cadet in the Officer Candidate School of the Marine Corps. They used a body relaxation technique that we were taught to make ourselves go to sleep because you're stressed out, you're fatigued out, and you, you get four hours of sleep a night if you're lucky. And so they taught you how to do a body scan, and this is just a very small portion of what mindfulness might be, but literally going through your body from top to bottom and being able to relax it to the point where I still practice that today. If I'm stressed and I wanna go to sleep, I can go through that in five minutes and fall asleep anywhere. But it's that kind of thing, being in touch with your emotions, being aware of what's driving you in a particular sense that would enable you in a stressful situation not to have that overreactive impulse or not to do that thing that you otherwise wouldn't do had you been in control of your emotions. It allows you not only to be aware of and control your own emotions and act in those situations, it also leads to better communication with your fellow staff members and with those inmates. This will go a long, a long way towards achieving that mindset that I believe the secretary was quoted as looking for, and that is officers realizing that public safety is protected when I assist as a change agent for inmates, when I model behavior that to them does not result in them saying, why should I change? The officers are abusive, corrupt, et cetera. Why, you know, if, if the system's that bad, why should I change? But instead, when they see modeled ethical behavior, reasonable behavior, instead of a mindset that every inmate is scum, and that's how I'm gonna treat them and I'm not going to interact with them or I, if I have to, it's as little as possible. I think Secretary Kernan was right. There was a day, and I hear this from a lot of the officers that came in years ago, when there was constant communication between inmates and officers. And I'm not talking about over-familiarity where you're compromising your personal information or anything like that. I'm talking about arm's length, professional relationships as he said, where you're fair, firm, and consistent, but where it's on an ongoing basis. It can't be seen necessarily as soft to do those things. And I'll give you a, a little anecdote. I was at CSP SAC about a month ago, and I was talking, there was a program going on um, in the, the uh, area that we were at, and there were four officers in the um, 
office space, and I went in to talk to him. I said, what do you guys think of this program? Actually, there were uh, three gentlemen and one female officer, and um, they all kind of looked at each other, wondering what each other was going to say. And then one of them said, well, I think it's a good program. And another one just kind of shook his head and said, ah, there's no hope. These guys aren't going to change. And then this first officer looked around the room, and another person said, well, I guess if they're sincere, it can be a good program. And that first officer said, well, I actually think I've seen changes in the guys that have been in this program. And so I asked each one of them, do you normally work here? Well, it turns out the two people that were either silent or saying this program's worthless, nobody can change, were officers who weren't regularly in that unit. They were there just as substitutions. The other two that were there regularly and saw this program over time and saw the inmates over time actually witnessed that change and were willing to say, yeah, I think the program's beneficial. But they were very hesitant to say it in front of these other two officers who didn't share that same experience and viewpoint. Now, to the one officer's credit, he did. But I think what we have to do is get to the point where officers realize that, yes, there's a percentage, and I know because I locked a lot of them up when I was a prosecutor, who are not going to change, who are not going to take what's offered to them. And we're not going to be able to do anything with them other than try to keep ourselves safe. But the overwhelming majority left over that are going to get out one day and want to change, we have to give them that opportunity. We have to give them an inspiration to change in the first place. And then we have to be supportive in them making that change. It's not a good enough for an officer to say, oh, it's good. These goody two-shoe volunteers are going to come in and do it. That's their job. That's not my job. Um, you know, but... It's like I've talked to the secretary about, and I, I believe he agrees, and I've talked to wardens about, this body is actually responsible to determine what gets hard support, tax dollar support. The wardens individually at each prison are responsible for what programs get soft support. And by that I mean the ability for volunteers to come in without being extra obstacles or hassles. One of the reasons San Quentin, and I'm sorry Senator Lou left, but one of the reasons San Quentin um, is so productive is because they have that kind of culture. And that's needed at every prison. Because it only takes a few people on a particular yard or an AW that's not supportive or a warden that's not supportive to make it impossible for volunteers or at least so bad that they don't want to come back. And simply by saying, we're gonna, we always are on lockdown, we're not going to get inmates to programs, we're not going to give them space, we're going to put all these hurdles in your way instead of trying to figure out solutions. I'm happy to say that I believe the current cadre of wardens in existence now is more supportive of programming and better than certainly 10 years ago when I began working for the state. And I say that because they practically compete with one another. And I would agree with Secretary Kernan. At the top, we have a total buy-in of what it's going to take. But getting that to trickle down, I think, takes some of these other things. And all of this has to be positive support for these officers that we're expecting to do it. And finally, in addition to positive support, it doesn't hurt to have external reinforcement once in a while. Law enforcement, both on the streets as well as some jails now that have been um, rolling out the use of fixed and body cameras in their facilities, have found that it has encouraged positive interaction on both sides between the staff and the inmates or the officer and the people they encounter. Let me be clear, that isn't the fix. One of the things that I thought was probably the worst question I was asked when I was going through the academy as a, uh, uh, in the sheriff's academy initially was, or I should say one of the lessons was, don't do anything. Back then we didn't have phones where they could take pictures of you all the time. I'm old. But back then they would say, don't do anything you wouldn't want your grandma to watch you and have you, you know, have her see. Now they say, don't do anything you don't want to see on the six o'clock news. That's the wrong lesson. The lesson is, don't do it because it's wrong, not because you'll get caught. So I want to add that caveat. We don't encourage cameras because we want to catch people or because they shouldn't do it because they'll get caught. We want to encourage people to do the right thing because it's the right thing. 
And ultimately, though, external pressures sometimes will help move people in that direction. So those are four items that certainly we could expand upon. I've had these conversations. I do want to commend the secretary. Ever since he's taken office, we've been in, in contact. He's been very receptive to um, programs and issues and, and uh, other strategies being used that I've shared with him. And so I'm, at the end of this, don't want to sound um, negative. I have a lot of hope for the system and I have a lot of hope for the department and I see my role as being value added to that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Secretary Kernan. Uh, 